I want you to get together. I had heard uh, from a documentary one time too that do you do you think that part of World War One and World War Two was to destroy a lot of all this too? Because I know that that was that yeah. kind of happened back then too. Absolutely. Well, World War One was a rise of empires. It was it was all the empires fighting each other in Europe specifically. Um, it seems like Europe is like a center point for a lot of these this architectural style. It seems like it was a, a central hub of some kind. I'm not trying to get all uh, European Israelite on you about this. I'm really not. You know, that's not what I'm saying. But it seems like it was. It was definitely some kind of hub for a lot of this architecture, um, and a lot of it was destroyed in the early 20th century, World War One and World War Two. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely was just just utter destruction of everything, and there's plenty of photos of that of just how vast the destruction was through carpet bombings and air raids and tanks and everything else, you know. And I was thinking about this the other day, actually, and, and I suppose I'm going to keep this in the modern age now and talk about it in a way maybe listeners can relate to. But I used to be an avid video game gamer. I used to game a lot. Um, I used to love my first-person shooters, you know. I don't play it anymore. And since having a child, I haven't touched the thing in, like, three years, you know. I just don't have time for that. Uh, I've left it all behind. But I used to play a lot of Battlefield. And uh, Battlefield 1 was a game that came out maybe about, I think it was came out maybe 2016 or something like that and you know what struck me most about the game is the beautiful architecture in the cities that the game is based in um and literally the whole game is you destroying all the architecture as you fight one another and, you know, the buildings have this amazing, the technology of the day, you know, they have this amazing destructive effect to them. Everything can be destroyed and crumble as you attack it with things and missiles and whatever, you know. Things just start, by the end of the game, the map is destroyed. All the buildings have been decimated, you know what I mean? Just through the sheer chaos of, of, of the destruction that your weaponry has caused. And I didn't realise until now, I may have to go back and watch it with new eyes, but a lot of the architecture you're destroying is, is what could be considered Millennial Kingdom Tartarian architecture. And it's as though wow. that game is telling you the truth in a subtle way. You know what I mean? Like, so much beauty, beauty was destroyed in this war. Like, one of the maps you fight on online is literally a, like a, um, a, a like Versailles, for example. Everyone always talks about that, that mansion um, with the fountains in the Tartarian, you know. Um, buildings like that you're destroying is where, where it's set, you know what I mean? With this beautiful pillared architecture, cathedral style everywhere, you know, huge courts with fountains and pillars and statues of angels everywhere and all this sort of thing. And it's like a stately home of some kind in France, in the middle of France or something. And you just you just decimate it. That's what you do. That's what the game is. You know, you're killing each other for points, but in the process, you're utterly destroying the remnants of the Millennial Kingdom, perhaps, in this game. And it's like they went out of their way to focus on that aspect of the game, you know, and you spend a lot of it in France, you know, and on in and at some point you go to um, Russia as well because of the communist Bolshevik revolution that happened during that time period, uh, fighting against the empire, the Russian empire, you know, and the kingdom. Um, and one of those battles takes place in this gorgeous orthodox cathedral and you just destroy the thing <laughs> you know, that's all you do and you flatten it and make it no longer exist anymore and by the end of the by the end of the 30 minute round you know and it's one of those things you don't notice the details of the game because you're just focused on trying to survive and shoot other people <laughs> but when you actually now i look at it with new eyes i realize i think that game was was literally like a joke it was they were like it's like the laughing at us you know, like they're telling you what happened. And uh, you find that's what a lot of media does. I mean, just on the same topic, what we're talking about messages in media, the Truman Show, for example, everyone always thought that was a flat earth analogy, you know. But I think it's more mm. of a false history, a false narrative analogy. Mm. Everything's a show. Everything's orchestrated by the media in that world. You know, everything that yeah. Truman sees and is put, put in front of him is... It's controlled by one, well, it's one person in the film, but it's a media team, isn't it? A team, a conspiracy, let's say. Mm -hmm. And 
I believe a lot of the events we're going to see unfold are contrived, scripted events to try and make it look like Revelation is coming to pass. And everything in Truman's life was a contrived, scripted event to sell products or something or to create drama that isn't real. I think it was telling us that clearly. You know, that's kind of how it's all going to unfold within an enclosed system, of course. <laughs> you know? And I think, again, this, this just lines in what I said at the start. We have to now start to reconsider everything again, conspiracy related with, with this new lens. Because I think we're going to start seeing things we didn't see before. Oh, yeah. yeah. I Yeah, I agree. And I was I was telling my wife this the other day uh, because I was telling her about, you know, the geological locations might not be where they are. And she said, well, what about that one guy that found all those chariot wheels and stuff in the Red Sea and stuff? And I said, honestly, I don't I don't know. I said, he, I don't know who that guy is. He could very well be an actor. You know, Ron Wyatt is who I'm speaking of. Hmm. And... I said, we could very possibly just be living on a stage, just kind of like what you're saying, where it's just everything is just uh, forcing you to kind of believe the narrative that we're being fed. And so it, it like it buries you even further down, deeper into all the uh, propaganda. Mm hmm. So. I believe, well, you look at the, the nature of, of secret societies, that's a big thing in the conspiracy. The Freemasons control everything, the Shriners control everything, you know what I mean? It's, it's the Jesuits, it's the Rosicrucians, you know, it's these Power 13, uh, Lumiati blood fam, uh, bloodline families, you know what I mean? It's, it's the Rothschilds, it's the Rockefellers. And when you actually start to look into the, the older history of these, of these societies, go back to the 1800s or 1700s, uh, one group really stood out to me, it's the Oddfellows. And these were really the ones that, again, took control of, of the post-millennial kingdom, shall we say, the little season. They were the, they were the ones who took the orphans under their job to, to rebuild. It's kind of like their attitude, you know, um, by the power of God, which God, I, I know they don't make that clear, but I think we know who it really is um, because they were aligned. They clearly, the secret societies are clearly aligned with the Luciferian doctrine. They make no secret of it, actually. Albert Pike confessed this himself, you know, and he was a member of the Odd Fellows, Albert Pike, who is also a high-level Freemason who wrote Morals and Dogma, which was the roadmap for Freemasonry. But you look at the Odd Fellows and you realise the role presidents and prime ministers, very, very, very high up people in governments, you know what I mean? They were all members of the Odd Fellows, give or take, maybe not all, but a lot of them were. But also in the mix with these presidents and high-end judges, statesmen, governors, you know, all these, these powerful, influential people are actors. Um, yeah. Charlie Chaplin, you know what I mean, for example. And there's a lot of them. I can't name them all. There's a lot of just random comedians and actors thrown in there. P.T. Barnum was a member. He was the greatest showman who invented the Three Ring Circus. Three Rings is the logo of the Oddfellows. So they've been incorporating it into everything. They've always controlled the media, including all forms of early entertainment during that age, like circuses, for example, which was the first proto form of entertainment for that era. <laughs> you know, they've always had the foot in it. But why are why are high end leaders and officials who dictate and control the narrative of culture, leaders of countries, mingling with actors? And I do wonder if the odd fellows was literally like a branch of the overarching group of secret societies. It was just one of them. Where the actors who play roles on the world stage are members. Which means that those playing the role of the current president, let's say, are merely just an actor playing that role on the stage of reality. And they're a member of this fraternity who's writing these scripts on behalf of their master, which would be Satan in the little season, you know. It just seems bizarre when you realize that why, why, why are these members like they're so unrelated to each other? You know, leaders of countries and small time actors are movie stars. You know, it's just are they all actually the same? Are they all actors? Is the Odd Fellows just the guild for the performers who get to play characters on the real stage called um, the mainstream narrative? <laughs> you know what I mean? Are they are they the ones who play those roles? We all know crisis actors exist. So we yeah. probably, probably, probably can't talk about that, you know, but it, we all know, like, they contrive events to make it seem like things are happening that aren't really happening. And that probably includes these people who are just currently playing the role of the president of the United States. 
<laughs> you know, and they have a script. Um, yep. and, and again, they're all in, they're all in the club, they're in the secret society and they've had that. And people theorize again, you know, we talked earlier about the Freemasons. They're the ones who basically moved into all this free real estate that was everywhere at the end of the millennial kingdom and claimed they built it. You know, we were the, <laughs> we were the mate, the stone masons who built all these buildings everywhere. And then you have the Shriners, which were an offshoot of Freemasonry with a Middle Eastern Islamic theme. And it just seems so bizarre. The backstory for why they exist is so stupid. It's a member of Freemason of Freemasonry went to a party one night, which had an Arabian theme, and he just loved it so much. He decided to invent a secret society with all the similar symbolism, for, <laughs> uh, for, just for fun one night. Okay, right. And now the Shriners, you know, have hospitals like over like two hundred hospitals in America alone, where they they minister to the sick, dying children, of course, for free. So they're a charitable, loving organization. But all of their shrines are in these temples, which are incredible Moorish Islamic design with onion domes and all these type of things. And they claim they built all these clearly complex temples, you know, which, which were built by a culture that is not shriners. You know, and, you know I mean? and it's kind of like they're just there to create a story to why these buildings exist. That's what the Freemasons and the Shriners are there for. And it's like, oh, yeah, the reason you see these Islamic temples, as we call them today in America, is because the Shriners built them for fun. Because they liked the theme and the style for their little club. But what if these buildings were already here and this needed a story to explain them? Like, they don't fit the theme of America. They shouldn't be there. It was by the dictation of history of where these buildings that supposedly come from by a mainstream narrative from English culture and European culture. They shouldn't exist why is there Moorish Middle Eastern architecture in the lands of America? You know what I mean? So to come up with a story, they have these secret societies just inventing stuff, just making stuff up, claiming ownership of it and claiming they built it, establishing things, founding things, you know, and changing the dates on, on inscriptions on rocks and stone to, to match the, their own version and story. It seems like a lot of that was going on. And that's what these secret societies are for. They're, they're just people who have aligned themselves with Satan during his little season, and they get to benefit from it. They get power, they get influence, they get free real estate, mansions to live in for free, you know what I mean? They get all sorts of benefits by siding with the devil during this time. And that seems to be what they are. They're actually just sellouts for their own kind. <laughs> it's the best way to describe them, you know. Um, I, just, I just thought, anyway, I've rambled on a bit, but I thought that was also an interesting angle, which doesn't get discussed as much. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, hey, so about the the buildings and stuff, there's a lot of people that think that these weren't really like dwelling places in a sense, mm. but I mean, they, they might have been, but some people are speculating that they were like energy harnessing facilities. Have you heard anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A cathedral is just a play on the word cathode, which is an energy cathode, right? Which is an yeah. energy storing device, you know. And it's possible what we call a cathedral actually had more parts to it at one point, <laughs> and it's missing. Yeah, they part. they took them yeah. out. Yeah. It's like a giant machine of some kind, which was used basically to power the entire area within, like, I don't know, a fifty mile radius or something like that, by harnessing energy through its spires from the ether. Yes, it seems like a lot of these buildings seem to have practical uses to their geometry and spires and and the way they're shaped and designed. Um, mm -hmm. If you zoom out, it looks like a circuit board. Most cities, I, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. That's yeah. very interesting. And it's it like, just it it seems too perfectly laid out to yeah, just do, be a coincidence. Do, do you know like the classic um, pillared rectangle building you see everywhere? And it's like a Parthenon, you would call it, it's like a Greek styled Parthenon. It's nothing but um, it's a rectangle cube, like a um, a cube. What do you call it? A, why kind of is it a cuboid? A cuboid, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, a, lo a long three D rectangle um, with just pillars going all the way round, and then it's got like a, a a pyramid roof on each end that goes across and it's basically like just a solid block and to us it looks like a grand piece of architecture but when you actually zoom out of it and look at it within the city it looks like a, a stereotypical black microchip with all its prongs sticking out the side that you stick into a microchip you into onto a, a, a board of some kind you know it's kind of like it was like a, a super advanced but you could describe it as primitive because it's using stone but a super advanced way of of controlling the flow of energy 
Like a lot of these buildings were designed for that reason, working with frequency vibration and geometrical forms which mimic those ethereal vibrations in order to channel them correctly. And it's like it was a global a globe, I keep using that word, I'm sorry. It's like it was no, a, it's like it was a you know, this this earth wide power grid. Probably likely linked to ley lines and all that gets involved as well, but um it seems like during the millennial reign it was powered free energy you know it was free energy everywhere everything was just glowing everything was it was a beautiful time to be alive it looked incredible you know and a lot of it was done through you know tesla arc type stuff <laughs> like electricity that can't damage you but can power everything type stuff you know uh i think i think to live through that time and to actually truly see it in its full glory without all the buildings that have been destroyed you know with them still being there uh, i don't think we can comprehend what it looked like really don't and you know it says you know in my father's house there's many rooms you know and he prepares yeah. a place for you um that seems to describe this kingdom that had these buildings with multiple rooms and building and it's like who's filling these rooms in these giant estates and these mansions that are built you know these stately homes and things like this it's kind of the, they look they look insane and it's, it looked yeah. like they actually had a practical purpose beyond simply sleeping in them I want you to get together.